Good afternoon, everyone. The 10th talk in this lecture series on neuroscience will be delivered by Dr. Collins Azizi. And the title of the talk would be Excitatory Inhibitory Balance Maximizes the Coding Capacity of a Network. Dr. Collins Azizi is an assistant professor in biology at ISER Pune. He started his trajectory in science as a physicist and gradually mentored into neuroscience during his PhD at the Center for Complex Systems in Florida Atlantic University and postdoctoral positions at the Salk Institute and the UC Riverside. His lab is interested in how algorithms are implemented in the wetware of the brain. To this end, the lab looks at two paradigmatic systems in the neuroscience, the olfactory system to understand how sensory input is represented in the brain and the spatial navigation to understand how the brain makes the maps of the world and creates memories of the places we have visited. So let us welcome Dr. Collins Assisi. Over to you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, let me share my uh, slide. Okay. So is, is this uh, visible to everyone as a yeah, yeah, yeah. Full screen. Yes. Okay, great. Right. Okay, so uh, so thank you so much, Srini, for uh, inviting me to talk here. It's uh, it's great to uh, chat with uh, with your ilk on neuroscience, right? <laughs> and uh, thanks, Sandeep and uh, Sundari, for uh, organizing things uh, around us. Now, I, I you know, since I have a captive audience, and I, and I know you guys have friends that you can pass this on to, I'm going to advertise our PhD program in biology. Do uh, share it. With friends who might be interested in pursuing a PhD in biology, we uh, uh, have a really diverse array of uh, uh, research that happens at ISER Pune. But here in this poster, I've just uh, focused on a on a thin sliver of things that we do in the biology department, and this specifically is uh, in neuroscience. And there are a few research groups uh, uh, doing very different. Uh, uh, sorts of things, uh, uh, sort of a wide spectrum of neuroscience that we uh, look at. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's that's the end of the advertisement. Do share this with, share this with your friends, even if you did not get the yellow submarine reference. But uh, uh, you are, of course, welcome to apply. So, uh, anyway, so so, so let, let let me start off. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the role of excitatory inhibitory balance and how it uh, maximizes what I call the coding capacity of a, of, of a network. Now, excitatory inhibitory balance is a uh, rather strange thing, right? It's uh, uh, so, so, for example, if you look at neurons in the cortex, uh, and you look at how much excitation is coming in and how much inhibition is coming in. They seem to be there seems to be a really fine balance between uh, uh, excitation and inhibition, which on the face of it seems somewhat absurd, right? Because if it it's it's sort of like uh, pressing the accelerator and the brake on a car at the same time to keep it keep it stationary. It's, it seems uh, like it's energetically terribly inefficient thing to do. And, and you know, different uh, sub networks in the brain would uh, balance excitation and inhibition differently. And one of the things that I'm hoping to, uh, to get to is to uh, try and understand what are the uh, computational imperatives that this excitatory inhibitory balance might actually serve. So the, before I get to talking about uh, about the about the work in general, let me start off by acknowledging uh, the collaborators on this project and. Uh, uh, much of the work that I'll be talking about was uh, done with Sandeep Chaudhary, who was an uh, undergrad and a master's student in, uh, uh, in Aysar Pune. And now he is doing his PhD in the Central European University. Uh, Pratyush has been following up on, on, on a lot of uh, uh, work that Sandeep did. And some of the early part of this uh, uh, of of, of uh, uh, what I'll present was uh, done in collaboration with Maxime and uh, Mark, and uh, we received funding for a lot of this work from the India Alliance DBT Welcome and generous support from from ISER Pune. All right, so 
you know, to start off, I, I sort of find this particular O'Donnell sachet uh, to be quite uh, an uh, uh, interesting uh, window into some of the things that we do, right? So on this O'Donnell sachet, you'll uh, see this conjecture that humans can smell a trillion different scents. Now, this is conjecture. It's not uh, uh, necessarily demonstrated. It's hotly contested. So it's it's not entirely clear whether we are astronomically good at smelling odors or whether we are merely extremely good at smelling odors and that we can we can smell about tens of thousands of them. Uh, so, so that's that's something that debate is not not settled, right? But this uh, thing, this this particular conjecture, leads us to a question, which is that how do networks encode uh, perhaps sensory stimuli, perhaps memories, perhaps motor patterns? But uh, you know, neuronal networks are capable of encoding a profusion of patterns. And the question that I'm going to try and address is, what are the properties, the structural properties of the network that allow it to do so? Can we build a simple network that can, in fact, generate a trillion patterns? And that's 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 sort of the question that I'm going to get to. But I'm, I'm of course, going to situate the uh, talk in the context of the olfactory system. It doesn't have to be, but it's an interesting backdrop to uh, think about some, some of this work. So I'll start off by telling you a little bit about the olfactory system. And then I'll talk about the kind of models that we uh, make of the olfactory system. Right. So if you look at the olfactory system, this is uh, a, a schematic of the uh, olfactory system. Uh, you can the organization of, of the olfactory system is, is such where let, let's say you have this uh, odd looking flower out here and uh, these little colored dots are different uh, molecular species that together constitute uh, a particular odor right and when you inhale then these molecules go into your nasal cavity and these molecules uh, fall upon receptors, odorant receptors that are present on these odorant receptor neurons. And, uh, you, you know, each uh, receptor neuron uh, tends to uh, express only a particular receptor type. Now, each of these uh, odorant receptors are selective or preferential preferentially selective to some molecules and not to others so there's a there's a whole range of uh, of of, of uh, uh, selectivities for different uh, for different receptor neuron types right now what happens is that uh, once these uh, molecules fall upon, upon these odorant receptors uh, it can initiate a whole cascade of of processes that can eventually lead this neuron to spike and the spikes from these neurons are then carried on to the next layer which is what's known as the olfactory bulb now the olfactory bulb is a dense network of excitatory and inhibitory neurons that are mitral cells that are granule cells all of them interacting with each other generating spectacular patterns of activity that then go on further to the olfactory cortex right so this is the mammalian olfactory uh, system or a caricature of the mammalian olfactory system and it's it's particularly complicated so we uh, tend to think of simpler systems and one of the uh, simple olfactory systems that one can think of is the locust olfactory system where instead of a nose you have uh, antenna and uh, where there are receptor neurons on the antenna uh, and uh, you, you know the the olfactory system out here has a lot of commonalities with the mammalian olfactory system and depending on you know al also a lot of differences of course but because of the uh, number of neurons that we have and uh, uh, you know the fact that some of these are easier to record from uh, 
it, it really helps us to get a sense of how the odor representation is transformed as it goes through different layers of the insect olfactory system. So here in the antennae, you have receptor neurons that also are preferentially sensitive to particular odorants and so on. These receptor neurons give their input to a bunch of inhibitory interneurons and projection neurons, which in turn project further out to the mushroom body and so on, right? So the part of the olfactory system that I am going to caricature in, in today's talk is actually the antennal lobe, right? So, so, so we'll talk about the activity of the antennal lobe, but we have to see it in comparison to the activity of receptor neurons. Right. So if you look at receptor neurons, and this is uh, uh, this is uh, uh, work by Barani Raman and uh, Joby Joseph, uh, who recorded from uh, olfactory receptor neurons in, in locusts. While, so here, here's the activity of two receptor neurons, ORN1A and ORN2A. Right? And what they did is they recorded the activity of these neurons as they exposed it to a number of different odorants. And uh, each row out here corresponds to a different trial of a particular odor. And the little line is a spike or it's it's the timing when that neuron fired a spike. Right? So if, if you were to look at the responses of these neurons to different odorants, you see a general pattern, which is uh, the responses follow this kind of a trajectory. This is the firing rate of these neurons, where there are some key parameters like the latency, the rise time, the fall time, uh, the, the fall time out here, adaptation, and so on. Right. So, so, so there is temporal diversity in the firing patterns of the olfactory receptor neurons, certainly, and it does play a role in the representation of the odor. But to a certain extent, at least, the receptor neurons are, uh, uh, as a first approximation, a uh, bit of on-off devices, right? They either see the odor or, 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 or they don't. And you can tell what odor it is by looking at which neuron fired. When it fired may not play that bigger bigger deal, or the the temporal patterning might not be that significant at the at the level of the receptor neurons. However, if you go to the next layer, uh, which is the antennal lobe, so the antennal lobe has projection neurons and inhibitory interneurons. What we know of the locust antennal lobe so far is that the inhibitory interneurons talk to each other. And they also inhibit the projection neurons. The projection neurons, on the other hand, innervate the inhibitory interneurons, but there are no excitatory connections that we know of between the projection neurons. Right? That's one. And the second is that the input from the receptor neurons goes to the projection neurons and the inhibitory interneurons. The inhibitory interneurons sort of arborize extensively across the uh, internal lobe. So it's likely that they receive inputs from all sorts of uh, receptor neurons. And because of this wide dendritic arbor, uh, the activation of all the LNs, it, it, it's not so, uh, it doesn't discriminate that much between odors, right? So uh, LNs are not uniformly, but certainly have a very uh, broad receptive field uh, when you look at odor space. All right, so that's that's the antenna lobe, but let's look at the activity of projection neurons. So when you look at the activity of, uh, uh, of projection neurons, here's the response of three projection neurons to two different odors. Now, the activity of projection neurons has a uh, more complex temporal patterning than uh, you would see in receptor neurons. They fire at higher frequencies, at different times of the odor presentation. Uh, sometimes they are hyperpolarized and get depolarized or uh, fire rebound spikes in response to, uh, uh, to uh, the odor being turned off. Uh, so, so you can have an elaborate spatiotemporal pattern in response to an odor presentation. So that's one. The second is that if you look at the activity 
of all the projection neurons, right? So if you pick all the projection neurons and you sum up their activity, then you're going to get a local field potential or, uh, you know, summed activity of projection neurons. And this is measured at the mushroom body, which is uh, what the uh, projection neurons give input to. So if you look at the summed activity of all the projection neurons, they generate this characteristic oscillatory uh, dynamics. And these oscillations in locus are of the order of 20 hertz, right? So you have spatiotemporal patterning evolving against a background of oscillations. All right, so uh, the, the idea then is that the representation of an order is not merely as the uh, identity of which neuron fired. It's also the, the, the time at which it fired is also important. So you can think of an order as a, uh, uh, from the, when you look at the projection neurons, you can think of an order as a movie that's evolving in time. And each frame of the movie takes place within one of these oscillatory cycles, right? So if you pick an oscillatory cycle, there's going to be some subset of neurons that are activated and some that are inactivated. When you go to the next frame of the movie, which is the next oscillation of, of the LFP, then a different set of neurons are activated and it can be an overlapping subset of neurons, right? So this whole temporal uh, sequence, this movie of uh, uh, the spatiotemporal pattern is what tells you that the smell that, that, that you just presented was a rose, right? Uh, something else would have a very different spatiotemporal pattern. So that actually brings us to the question, right? The question is, can a brain represent a, a trillion orders? And this question, in, in the light of what we've just seen, can be rephrased. And it can be rephrased or transmogrified. Transmogrify is a word that I love to use. It comes from Calvin and Hobbes, meaning to transform in a surprising or, or magical manner, right? So this question, can the brain represent a trillion orders transmogrifies into the following question. Can a network make a trillion patterns? And not only can it make a trillion patterns, can it reliably make a trillion patterns, right? And that's the question that we are going to try and address. Now, uh, when you look at any uh, sort of network that generates patterns, the first things that come come to mind, and this, of course, uh, extending from work that goes over a hundred, uh, uh, over a century of work in uh, in this area of central pattern generators. These, these are the quintessential pattern generators in, in neuroscience. And, and these are, uh, are uh, central pattern generators that uh, uh, drive movement, right, in various organisms. This particular pattern generator drives movement in the rhythmic movement in a leech heart, uh, the lobster uh, pyloric ganglion, uh, the pyloric dilator, uh, you know, all of these different networks generate patterns. But what's really key to a lot of these networks is that the engine that drives pattern formation in uh, spatiotemporal patterning in these networks is a reciprocal inhibitory network, right? Neurons uh, that inhibit each other, antagonistic competing neurons. Uh, when one fires, it stops the other from firing and so on. And this competition is what gives rise to spatiotemporal patterns. That's the engine that drives these networks uh, so, so, for example, this particular triangular network that you see has three groups of neurons. And because they inhibit each other, they generate this precise pattern where different neurons fire at different phases. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to use something akin to a glorified central pattern generator to create uh, patterns. And try and understand. So these pattern generators uh, can generate a few different patterns, right? Maybe two, because sometimes uh, the, the muscles or, or the groups of muscles that need to, uh, to uh, contract and expand at 
uh, in in a periodic manner might change right so you you'll have one or two or or a few different combinations that that you need but how do you extend this to a trillion different uh, uh, different patterns and that's the question that we are we are we're going to get to, right so inhibition is key and we know that in the locus antenna lobe in fact in a lot of other networks in a cortical networks inhibition is key in generating patterns in fact uh, i i think it was buzaki who uh, used the line that excitation only begets more excitation you have this boring synchronization that propagates across the network and in in order to separate the dynamics of different projection neurons you need these inhibitory interactions now how how do you uh, sort of model these inhibitory interactions right so let's take the most elementary uh, reciprocal inhibitory network right so here you have two interneurons these are interneurons that are uh, based on the locus uh, antenna lobe inhibitory interneurons in the locus antenna lobe and this is done using a conductance based uh, model that reasonably approximates reality so you have these two neurons that uh, inhibit each other right that reciprocally inhibit each other and what you see is that when the orange neuron fires it kicks the green neuron into submission. The green neuron can't fire because they're competing against each other. And then at some point, uh, the activity flips and the green neuron starts to fire and the orange is, uh, is kicked into submission. And, 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 and the reason this flip happens is because these neurons also have a uh, calcium dependent potassium current which changes over a slow time scale and if you look at successive spikes of these of of the orange neuron you'll see that the time between these spikes increases uh, and it reaches a point when it can no longer inhibit the green neuron and that's why the flip takes place so if you turn off this calcium dependent potassium current then you're going to get only one of these neurons back right so competition gives rise to uh, alter an alternating pattern of activity. Now, there's there's an interesting structural feature of networks that uh, uh, relate very nicely, can be usefully uh, used while usefully used. What am I thinking? Can can be uh, useful in thinking about the dynamics of these antagonistic networks, right? So so what's that? That is a property known as graph color. Right. So let me go on a tangent and tell you what a graph coloring is, and then we'll come back to see how how it affects the uh, how it relates to the dynamics of inhibitory networks. All right. So graph coloring is essentially a prescription, and the prescription is that if you take two nodes of the network or vertices of the network, whatever you want to call it. If, if two vertices of a network are directly connected to each other, like, sorry, like these two guys are, they are directly connected to each other, then you assign different colors to them, right? So if, if, if you take this random network, this uh, node is connected to this node. It's also connected to this node out here, right? So we know that these two nodes should have different colors associated with them and those that are not connected together can be assigned the same color right so when you look at this this guy is a bluish colored node it's directly connected to this one so it has to be a different color and that's we've chosen green out there right now these two are blue and they don't connect to each other that's what's guaranteed by this prescription right so what the the idea out here then is that if two nodes are directly connected to each other, they're assigned different colors, but also if they're connected to each other, they can't do the same thing because they, they, they're they competing with each other and the interactions are antagonistic, right? So let's, you know, it turns out that the graph coloring problem is a rather hairy problem and given random graphs, it's a real pain in the neck to color them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with very simple networks and then we'll graduate to somewhat more complex networks right so if you look at this particular network this is an engineered network where we have three groups of neurons and 
each of these groups have connections across, right? They're all to all connected across groups. And that's what this connectivity matrix shows within groups. So if you look at the blue group within the group, there are no connections. So they, these are all zeros. But across groups, you will see that they're all connected, right? So they are connected across groups. So you have to associate three colors with these three groups of neurons uh, based on our, our graph coloring prescription. And now let's drive this network of neurons and see how they respond. Right? So if you drive this network, what you will see is that all the orange neurons fire in approximate synchrony, where each of these little lines correspond to the time when a neuron spikes. So the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the identity of neurons. And uh, you'll see that all the orange neurons fire in approximate synchrony, the green in approximate synchrony, and the blue in approximate synchrony, and they change, they switch around, right? So, so the connectivity of the network imposes synchrony among neurons that are associated with the same color, right? And the competition between these different colored neurons gives rise to a spatiotemporal pattern that evolves in time. Now, this is, of course, a simple network, and it's it's what's known as a k-partite uh, network. But you can have so slightly more complex networks, right? So consider this example, right? So here you have four groups of neurons. And, and in the left uh, uh, network out here, they're all to all connected, right? Now what I can do, so, so since they're all to all connected, you have to assign different colors to them, red, green, blue, and, and brown. Now what I can do is I can chop off these connections between the brown and the red, and I can chop off the connections between the brown and the blue, right? Now what do I get? I'll get this network. And here, when you color this network, you know that this guy out here, it can't be green because it's directly connected to the green uh, group of neurons but it can be red and it can be blue. And this ambiguity, this degeneracy, this multiple colorings actually have dynamical consequences. And the dynamical consequence in, in the internal lobe network that we've been simulating is the following, right? So these three groups of neurons are red, green, blue, and you will see that they fire in, in alternation uh, as, as the uh, network connectivity would suggest. However, if you look at this ambiguous group, it fires with the red and it fires when the, it fires when the blue neurons fire, it fires when the red neurons fire. However, when the green neurons fire, it's shut up. It, it, it just shuts up completely, right? So, so, so this ambiguous group can associate itself with different uh, groups of neurons, right? It, it can switch allegiance from red to blue and so on. But when the green turns on, it just goes quiet, right? So, so you can have multiple ways in which you can color these networks. All right. dynamics of these networks evolve. Now, when you look at the insect brain, you're actually, you come across such astounding complexity in, in the organization of the insect brain. And this is, uh, this is what the connectivity of, of the uh, brain of a uh, fruit fly looks like. And so, thinking about it, these networks that we've been simulating are nowhere in, in uh, terms of complexity as, uh, as, as real brains, right? And one way to deal with it is not really to jump into the enormous complexity of, of, a, of a whole brain, but to find a system that is sufficiently complex that it encompasses several real constraints that you would see in the olfactory system. However, you can still wrap your mind around this model system, right? And I am going to uh, talk about one such model system that uh, Sandeep and I uh, uh, decided to start tinkering with. And this comes from a uh, rather unusual source, which is the game of Sudoku. Right. So uh, 
bear with me for a little bit while I uh, ramble on about uh, Sudoku, and I promise you I'll get back to spatio-temporal patterning in, in networks in, in a second, right? So what's Sudoku? Sudoku is this very simple game, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this game, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you anyway. Uh, it's this, uh, the, the typical Sudokus that you see in newspapers are this nine by nine grid. So you have a nine by nine grid. And there are numbers that are filled into uh, different uh, locations of this nine by nine grid. And the objective of this particular game is to fill in the blank squares out here under the constraint that if you look at each row, column, or three by three box out here, the integers from one to nine must occur only once. So you can't have one occurring more than once. So the integers can't occur multiple times. You should have uh, one to nine occurring once in this three by three box in each row and each column, right? Now, if you give sufficient clues, uh, so if you give sufficient clues, for example, in this Sudoku, if you give all of these clues, then you end up with a unique solution, right? But what happened, and, and you know, we, we know now that the lower bound, I think, to get a unique solution is uh, 16 or 17 clues that you have to provide for the Sudoku. Now, if I start taking out some of these clues, then more and more solutions become possible, right? So when I take those, those out, you've taken a few constraints from your game and you can, in principle, have more solutions. And as I take out more and more clues, the number of potential solutions keep increasing. And when I take out all the clues, this gives you all possible Sudoku solutions. And the number of possible Sudoku solutions is that. Right, so that's about ten to the power nine, and uh, this number uh, does not include solutions with certain symmetries, rotations, and so on. So it takes out a lot of redundancy, and you have about ten to the power nine solutions that are possible. Now, the 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 way this relates to uh, to spatio-temporal patterning and the profusion of patterns you can generate using a network is that if you can build a network that can generate activity pa patterns, spatio-temporal patterns of activity that map to Sudoku solutions, then you have the chance of creating 10 to the power nine such patterns, right? And that's what uh, Sandeep and I uh, tried to do in this particular network, right? So let's build a network which incorporates the constraints of, of Sudoku, right? So let's say that you have a grid and let's place a neuron in each of these cells of the grid, in each of the squares of the grid. Now let's say that a number from one to nine is going to be associated with the time, and, and these neurons are oscillators, I'll tell you in a little bit, or the phase at which the neuron fires, right? So that constraint basically means that all the neurons in a row, a column, or a nine by nine uh, subgrid out here would have to fire at different times, right? And how do you make sure that all the neurons in a row fire at different times? Well, you connect them using inhibition. And if they're all to all connected, you know that they can't fire at the same time, they'd have to fire at different times. Same thing for each of the rows and same thing for each of the uh, three by three blocks. So you can build a, a Sudoku constraint matrix using this particular prescription. All right, so once you build a network using this prescription, uh, you've got to figure out what neurons to put in there. And one possibility would have been, of course, to use the same sort of uh, uh, conductance-based neurons that we uh, uh, simulated for the internal loop, but we actually chose a far simpler uh, sort of uh, uh, phenomenological uh, neuron out here, uh, which uh, basically it, it, it's an integrate and fire neuron, which I'm sure you're well aware of. So uh, the, 
the way this neuron operates is that uh, if, if you're not giving it any input, the membrane potential remains zero. When you turn on an input, then the membrane potential rises and it rises gradually till it hits a threshold. When it hits a threshold, it generates a spike and it gets reset to zero. And if you keep this external input on, then the membrane potential is going to go up again, generate a spike, reset, and things like that. So this particular neuron, if you give it a constant input, is going to behave like a periodic oscillator. Right? Now, if you have a periodic oscillator, uh, in our case, a pulse-coupled oscillator, you can map a periodic oscillator to a circle, right? So as the membrane potential increases, you can think of the phase of the oscillator going around in circles. It reaches a threshold. When it reaches a threshold, it generates a spike, right? And uh, we can think of the, the, the phase of the oscillator is very simply the angle that it makes with respect to some uh, reference phase, right? Now, let's couple these neurons and let's take two of these neurons coupled to each other and this is excitatory coupling that you have out here now what happens in 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 this particular uh, uh, in this particular simple network well let's look at this neuron the phase of the neuron increases gradually it reaches a threshold so it's gone around the circle and it's come back out here at at 2 pi and when it reaches out here it emits a spike right it emits a spike and it gets reset and then it goes on again but look at the effect of the spike on the post synaptic neuron right so the post synaptic neuron which is this guy out here starts off at a different initial phase it goes it it, it, it goes towards its threshold and when it gets to this point where this neuron fires a spike the spike goes down hits the post synaptic neuron and it instantaneously advances the phase of the postsynaptic neuron, right? So that's the effect of excitation. It advances the phase of the postsynaptic neuron, which then goes on and spikes once it reaches a threshold, right? But you can, you, you can see what would have happened if this spike didn't take place. If this spike didn't take place, then this neuron would have gone on and fired at a later point of time. So for this particular neuron, an excitatory spike tends to uh, bring the uh, the following spike a little earlier in time, right? And inhibition would have the opposite effect. So if it were an inhibitory input, then this blip that you see would go downwards and the spike would be delayed, right? So that's what would happen with inhibition. Now, the, the effects of excitation and inhibition are sort of illustrated in this. The top traces are two neurons that are coupled by excitation. They start off with some phase difference. And over time, the, uh, the they sort of move to synchrony, right? They start firing at the same phase. If you look at this, uh, the bottom two traces, these are inhibitory neurons. And here the blip that I was talking about goes downwards. And that tends to push the neurons further and further apart. And they go in opposite phases, right? So if you take nine of these pulse coupled oscillators and you connect them all to all and you let it evolve, you'll see that the phases of these oscillators are splayed all around the circle. And, uh, you know, the, the so, so these nine would actually go around in the circle with maintaining a phase difference between them. All right. So if you were to take n pulse coupled oscillators, well, actually, if you were to take n of these oscillators and not couple them, and you just drive them, they would all generate a periodic pattern in some arbitrary phase, depending on where you started. So they'd just be going around in circles. What happens when you couple them based in, in based on the constraints that we started off, the constraints of the Sudoku network? So when you couple them based on Sudoku constraints, uh, so, so this is a simulation of 81 oscillators. They're going around in, uh, in a circle. And these 81 oscillators are coupled together uh, in a manner that I described using that Sudoku uh, network. 
Now, this is the start of the simulation. And what this settles down to is something like this, where you have nine blobs of groups of neurons that go around in circles, right? And this uh, is, is sort of the steady state solution that the system comes to. Uh, you get nine groups of neurons that go around and the phases of these groups are separated from each other. Now, how do you take this and map it back to a Sudoku solution? And that's what I'll show you next over here, right? So on, on the x-axis out here, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I think I... Okay, so on the x-axis out here, you have time and on the y-axis you have the identity of neurons and these are numbered from 1 all the way to 81 right so 1 2 all the way up to 81 and these little blue dots that you see is the time when that neuron spiked all right so let's take a particular instant in time which is highlighted by this red uh, line out here well I, I should also tell you how how the these two map to each other Right? So here you have neurons marked 1 to 81. And the first neuron is the neuron out here. The second neuron, which is this line, the second row out here in this raster plot, is this guy out here. The third is this guy out here. So in, in this block, the way I've numbered the neurons is 1, 2, 3, all the way to 9, 10, 11, 12, up to 18. And it goes all the way like that, all the way up to 81. Right, so you have 81 neurons and each cell out here is connected to one of these rows in the raster plot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a particular instant in time and look at which neurons fired. And I'm, this is a full Sudoku solution. And I'm going to see whether it matches that Sudoku solution. Right, so Colin, that's, a small doubt. Yes, uh, sorry ahead. to interrupt uh, no, no, because absolutely. I want to understand. Okay, the each cell in the Sudoku corresponds to a neuron, right? That Co corresponds to a neuron. Now, yes. what does the numerical value correspond to? The phase of the oscillator? Or? No. So here, what I'm plotting is just the uh, membrane potential. But you're right. The membrane potential it's periodic, so the membrane potential actually corresponds to the phase. So you there, right. there's a direct mapping between the phase. The numerical so, value and the phase. Exactly. Yeah. So so what's happening out here is this is neuron one and neuron one fires right and that's connected to this particular cell now in 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 the sudoku solution the cell has number three right now we can go down and look at another neuron which is this guy out here right which is neuron number 17 and if you go to neuron number 17 that also has uh uh, the number three. Okay. So all the neurons that fire at a given time are associated with the same number in the Sudoku grid. They're all firing at a particular phase, right? So the next one is 22, which is also a three and all the others, right? Now, if you go to the next time step and you find out all the neurons that fire at that time step, those would be associated with a different number. But all of them would be associated with the with the same number, right? So the 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 point out here is that for this particular Sudoku constrained network, each spatiotemporal pattern that it generates can be directly mapped to a solution of to a Sudoku solution, right? And since there are a the, there is a profusion of of Sudoku solutions that are possible, the idea out here being that each spatiotemporal pattern can be generated to one of, can be mapped to one of those Sudoku solutions, right? So if you look at this particular, uh, so, so, so this network that I, I talked about, there's, there's a little thing that I didn't tell you, uh, which is that, uh, you know, I, I showed this as a purely inhibitory network. Now, it turns out a purely inhibitory network won't give you these Sudoku solutions. You actually need to have another ingredient, and that ingredient is complementary excitatory drive, right? And, and what does that one mean by that? So here's the inhibitory network. So you have, uh, uh, here you have uh, 20 neurons, and these 20 neurons are split into two groups. 
there are no within group connections and that's what these diagonal blocks of zeros tell you. And off diagonal, there are a number of ones, which means that across group, there are a number of connections, but those connections are random. Some neurons connect to each other and some don't. Now, if I were to take this particular network and just drive it, you'll see that uh, this, this sort of pink uh, 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 demarcation out here is what the different groups do, right? And you'll see that there is some uh, sort of differentiation in the firing pattern, but there's also a certain amount of mixing. So it actually doesn't do this precise uh, spiking. And the reason it doesn't do that is because if you take any neuron in a particular group, it receive each. So, so this neuron, for example, may receive a different set of inputs from another from the other group than a different neuron out here, right? Which means that they don't receive the same inputs at any particular point in time. So even so, so unlike in the earlier examples, they're not going to fire synchronously. You need to have a way to bring these uh, opposing groups together, right? So that neurons that are in these different groups fire together. And the way to bring them together is to have a complementary excitatory network. So this particular network is an excitatory network that's built on top of this inhibitory network. And all the zeros out here are ones in this network, right? So stuff that's associated with a particular group will tend to synchronize due to this excitation, right? Now what you do is that here, there's very little or no excitation in the top panel. Here, there's an intermediate level of uh, excitation. It doesn't exactly match the inhibition, but there's an intermediate level of excitation. And in the third panel at the bottom, you have a huge amount of excitation that literally swamps the inhibition. So what you will see out here is that these groups separate out very nicely only when your excitation is balanced. Not, I, sh I shouldn't use balance, just countered by excitation. If it's not countered by excitation, then within group stuff doesn't gel together. And if the excitation is too much, then they're all going to synchronize, right? So the idea out here is that in order to get a Sudoku solution, it's not enough to have an excitatory network, uh, to have an inhibitory network. You also need excitatory connectivity to counter that inhibition and bring stuff uh, together that belong to a particular group. All right, so, so, so we clearly can uh, get Sudoku solutions. Now, what we've also sh uh, been able to show is that, so on the x-axis out here, we have changed the strength of excitation. We're holding the inhibitory strength constant. And here, uh, you start off the system with a with 500 odd initial random initial conditions and you find out how many of these initial conditions settle to a sudoku solution it doesn't matter what that sudoku solution is and if your excitation is very low then very few uh, settle down to a uh, stable pattern. Whereas as you increase the amount of excitation, the number of initial conditions that settle within a certain point in time, right? There's a, there can be very long transients, uh, increase till it peaks at some value of excitation and further down it goes, uh, goes down again. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the yellow line out here because this is a peculiar class of networks that I won't be talking about in, in, in this talk. All right. So, so, so you have a peak-like structure that tells you that excitation that counters the inhibition tends to give tends to maximize the number of stable patterns. All right. Now, not only it turns out as O'Donnell keeps telling us, not only can you generate a profusion of patterns, you can also remember these patterns, meaning these patterns are stable for a whole year, despite all the other odors that you've smelt over the year, and despite the fact that odors come to you in such a noisy uh, manner, right? So, so, so clearly, not only are the odor representations uh, possible, they're also very stable. And we need to check whether the representations that we arrive at are indeed stable. And one way to do this is to perturb the network. 
and see if things settle back to, to the pattern that we started at. Now, in order to do this perturbation, uh, I'm, uh, so, so earlier we were looking at, at, at neurons go around in circles. Here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the relative phase with respect to some arbitrary group of neurons. You can measure the relative phase of all the other neurons. And I'm going to plot the relative phase over time. Right. So here the system settled to some uh, to, to some stable state uh, to, or to some state. And uh, that's what these different lines uh, look like. So each of these colors, there are nine neurons associated with each of these uh, color traces, and they're all synchronized within groups till it gets to about 500 milliseconds where I give it a random bump and the random bump perturbs these neurons and then we can watch it settle down to the uh, state that it initially started off at right so this particular state is stable to perturbations uh, though if the perturbations are large enough you can switch the pattern such that the uh, such that the activity would then settle to a different sudoku solution right? so you can do all of these things but the key thing being that to small perturbations the system is indeed stable so not only can you generate a profusion of patterns these patterns seem to also be stable now the question is how does this uh, connect to how 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 does the network generate this profusion of patterns? Uh, why do we get these stable patterns? And how does it connect to what we know about uh, networks, similar networks that have been designed to store patterns as memories, right? And the most famous example, of course, uh, being uh, a Hopfield uh, network. And, uh, you know, the Hopfield network is, of course, a uh, classic example of an associative memory. And the way Hopfield talks about an associative memory is that, let's say you have an item that's stored in memory. And the item in this particular case is this phrase, which, uh, which is a reference to a paper by Kramers and Vanier, Fizrev, uh, uh, volume 60, page 252, uh, year 1941, right? So that's the phrase that you have stored in memory. And a content addressable memory would be capable of retrieving this entire phase on the basis of partial information. If you just say Vanier 1941, then perhaps that might be enough to jog your memory such that you get this entire reference back. Right? And, and, and the way Hopfield did that was he provided a prescription that allows a network to, you, you can engineer a network such that you can make some states of the network stable. And this two-dimensional representation, this cartoon says that, let's say that this particular state of the network corresponds to this reference. And if you're in the vicinity of this state, if you're in the vicinity, meaning if, if you're given just partial information, you tend to go and settle into this particular state. Now, the problem with this kind of a conception is also an issue with the capacity of the network. Because if you increase the number of uh, states that you want to engineer, the, if, if you increase the number of memories that you want to store in the network, then these memories are going to start getting closer and closer together. They're going to clump closer and closer together. And when you give partial input, you end up in a situation where you might uh, where, where you might confuse one memory for, for another. So it turns out that a Hopfield network has a capacity which is of the order of 10% of the total number of neurons that are used in, in the network. So how do we uh, given, so, so, so when you look at this, if you're given 81 neurons as we have, then you should be able to encode about eight memories in it. How do you encode 10 to the power nine, right? So how, how do you get around this capacity limitation? Well, the answer is in looking at how these representations are encoded. If you take a particular memory in a Hopfield network, it's represented as a static pattern of zeros and ones. It's a vector of zeros and ones, which tell which is which is connected to a particular uh, uh, pattern in, uh, in 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 memory. Right. What we've done in our network is that uh, 
we have extended our representation over time. So our representation of an order or, or any, uh, anything is not a static pattern in time, but in our case, it is not a static pattern, but it is a pattern that extends in time. And by stretching the and, and by extending things in time, we have actually stretched to the dimensions of our space. And that's what allows us to put in a lot more patterns than a uh, Hopfield network, for example, can uh, can put in. All right. So I'm, I'm going to stop out here. And I, I, I think the takeaway uh, uh, should be that, you know, uh, can a can a brain represent a trillion orders we've, we've sort of switched that to the question of can a network make a trillion patterns and it turns out that a small network of 81 neurons can generate a profusion of patterns so there are certainly bottlenecks to how many orders uh, we can remember and it's uh, unlikely to be a trillion but the claim that we make out here is that it's not the network that's the bottleneck. The bottlenecks lie elsewhere. There certainly are. But I think a network is capable of generating a large profusion of, of patterns. All right. So I'm going to stop out there and uh, uh, take questions, I guess, if there's time. So can you guys hear me? Shall I stop presenting? Yeah, anybody does does anybody have questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. I wanted to ask one question. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, here you uh, have drawn a uh, comparative analogy between the Hopfield network, the attractor state, uh, which uh, are regarded as a memory elements that are stored mm -hmm. in the Hop Hopfield network, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this uh, and this network. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, you are telling that uh, in this particular network, uh, the patterns are stored in, in a temporal fashion. That means yes. if there are five neurons mm -hmm. or five oscillators in the neuron or mm -hmm. in the network, mm -hmm. then uh, the how the, uh, the these oscillators are firing temporally mm -hmm. are uh, like uh, we can look at that and we can uh, by looking at that we can uh, say there are uh, uh, many number of memory items are stored temporarily. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Actually, Deepan, so, can uh, I add this? Yes, uh, yes. So, Collins, I want to clarify, I want to understand. Mm -hmm. Is your state vector the relative phase vector? Yeah. Right? Yes, yes. So, each relative phase vector is a stable state, is a vector, whatever. You know, that's what you're is, calling is a, is a stable state. So, it's not a sequence of relative phase vectors. It well, you know, I I so okay. So let let's let's put it this way. So each uh, attractor in this particular network is a periodic pattern of a sequence of neurons firing. Oh, okay. Right. So so the periodic so so in in this particular case, uh, the neuron fires repeatedly, but from between two firings of a particular neuron, there are eight other groups of neurons that have fired. So does it amount to a fixed relative phase vector? Uh, it is a fixed, so, so it is a sequence, it is a fixed relative phase vector. Yes. Fixed relative, relative phase vector? Yes. Okay. Right? Now, what, the, the, the reason that your encoding can be uh, that high is because so you have 81 neurons, right? And so you have uh, 81 relative phases, and it's possible to have all combinations of these uh, relative phases uh, out there, right? Uh, but there is a base so, of attractor around each uh, stable state. So, yes. the, the, so we've done a simple perturbation. Uh, out there and you, you know you can perturb it it'll settle back right we haven't uh, we haven't extracted the basin of attraction uh, the the other thing is that uh, it's also extremely dense right so uh, not not only do you have it's it's not a single periodic attractor but it's uh, uh, 
10 to the power 9 periodic attractors in, in this uh, phase space. And uh, you, you, the, the, the sort of uh, balance that you arrive at of excitation and inhibition is extremely important for that stability, right? Otherwise, you will end up with patterns that skip across different uh, uh, different uh, uh, periodic uh, states, sort of uh, itinerant trajectories over periodic uh, orbits is what you would end up with. So uh, there is a sliver of parameter space where, uh, where this uh, works. And uh, uh, within that range, you do get uh, periodic patterns, large number of periodic attractors. So, does that address your question, Dipan? Oh, yeah. sure. Yes, uh, that uh, somewhat addresses my question. Okay. I, I had uh, one other question that you were saying that this is a, this, uh, there is 10 to the power 9 number of periodic attractors. Yes. So uh, is this number uh, somehow dependent on the simulation, um, like, uh, right. like simulation DT time that we are using, delta T time? So, so you know, if there are delays in interaction, right, between uh, neurons, these are instantaneous changes in phase. Uh, if there are delays, then that can actually throw a spanner in, in the wax out here. Uh, so the delays have to be extremely small. The integration time constant, I don't think is that... Uh, important the dt uh, is, yes. is that what you're talking about yes yes right so I, 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 I why do you think that that would be a concern because, because yeah go ahead because you are telling that between uh, a neuron uh, when it is firing two consecutive spikes mm -hmm. uh, you are taking the states uh, uh, of say 81 neuron or whatever mm -hmm. the number of neurons are are, right. uh, between that time interval itself. So those right. states which are coming between uh, one, two successive spikes are considered, uh, are actually giving rise to this 10 to the 1, 9 numbers. Right, right. So, well, you know, I, so you just need, so between two spikes of a particular neuron, there are essentially eight groups that fire. So you're literally dividing your uh, 0 to 2 pi into nine uh, segments. So it's, it's not like uh, there are, it's, it's not that the sequence length is not 10 to the power 9. So I would understand uh, that your, uh, the, the, so, so your question of whether DT is important, it would be very important if I need 10 to the power 9 neurons to spike in between. But that's not what I uh, need, right? I just need eight groups to spike in between. So the time DT is not uh, uh, really that much of a constraint. However, if I, need, if I needed a sequence with 10 to the power 9, then yes, I, I would need to have a very fine uh, DT okay. in order to model that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody, any questions? So good afternoon. Uh, I had a question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so sir, you spoke about the Hopfield networks and uh, how there is, uh, you know, they regain their stability after perturbation has been caused. So yeah. have you like uh, researched this particular, you know, per stability attained after perturbation mm -hmm. in a, you know, pathological model? Because in case we draw, a, you know, a corollary between uh, what happens in the human brain during, mm -hmm. say, Alzheimer's or any dementia oriented, uh, you know, uh, memory loss. So can can this uh, model be, you know, uh, sort of extrapolated in the human brain in order to, you know, regain memory functions? So uh, le let's see. So, so, so the question you're asking is that I'm, 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 I'm trying to uh, understand the question here. So, what you're saying is that how are you relating the perturbations to uh, to dementia? Can can you? Uh, Sure. Right, sure, sir. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, would I, you would you want me to elucidate? I'm so sorry. I, yes, please. Uh, yes, please. Th thank you. 
Okay, okay. So, uh, sir, I was saying like you spoke about perturbations in this particular uh, coupled or this phase coupled oscillators mm -hmm. which you spoke about. And once right. the perturbation had passed over, we see that mm -hmm. there is a regain of the stable state, right? right. So, right. what my question is, sir, can this be extrapolated into a dementia model where the degeneration of the interneurons mm -hmm. which occurs in the hippocampus is serving as the perturbation? So, can we see a stability I, I see after that if we connect it with the hop I, field and yes. I, I, I see okay. I see your uh, question now. So, okay. you know, the, so the perturbation perturbation that I'm giving the system up. So, so, so there are two kinds of perturbations that you can do hmm, in the system. Right. One perturbation is where you basically just uh, randomly perturb the state of the system, right? So the system is in some particular state, you randomly perturb the state of the system. The kind of perturbation that you're talking about is what one would think of as a structural perturbation. So here, what you're talking about is not perturbing the state of the system, but perturbing the parameters that define the system itself, right? So when you say perturb the network, you're literally maybe chopping off a connection between right, uh, right, two absolutely. neurons, right? So, right. That, so, so that's a structural perturbation and not the kind of perturbation that I, I, I presented. So now, now I see a point. Now, that, that's a really interesting question as to... Uh, whether this network would be resilient to structural perturbations. Now, you know, I, what's the level of redundancy, for example? So let's say that you had two... Okay, this might be a very naive uh, answer, right? But let's say that you have two groups of neurons, few within group, large number of across group connections, right? If I were to chop off one across group connection, this simple network would continue to uh, sort of work in this antagonistic manner and the pattern would persist. Now, in the Sudoku network that we have, apart from uh, this grouping into, in, into nine groups, there is also a symmetry that that these networks have. And, and, and we have looked at symmetries of, of networks in, in great detail. So if you were to chop off uh, a connection between two groups in, in the Sudoku network, say the groups that represent the three and the group that represents the nine, right? So let's say I chop off uh, something like that. So not only does it, uh, uh, I, I mean, it, it introduces an asymmetry in the network that can have pretty significant consequences. And for a small network that's just 81 neurons uh, large, uh, that houses so many different attractors, chopping that one and introducing an asymmetry can have uh, consequences that cascade across the network. So I would not think that the Sudoku network is structurally stable in the manner that uh, uh, you're, you're asking. However, if I have a lot more neurons, I can think of ways that I can introduce redundancies in the network. And despite cutting uh, connections, I might still be able to maintain certain symmetries in the network. So, for the for the network that I've simulated, I don't think it is structurally stable uh, to chopping off connections. We have tried it. Uh, we can. We, we have tried it in 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 a very controlled manner, and we sort of know uh, when the orderings would change, how much we'd have to perturb the structure to have the orderings change, and it turns out that it's very fragile for some perturb structural perturbations and robust for others. Uh, but uh, in general, it's uh, it is pretty fragile. But larger networks might might be more structurally stable. I, th I think that's a very important question, and I th I think we uh, need to think about this a little bit more. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. So okay, guys. Uh, for reasons of time, if you have further questions, I encourage you to you know get in touch with the speaker. It's a very you know exciting talk. But Collins, I would like to get back to you. I have very lot of interest in this topic. The Deepa yeah, yeah. is works on oscillator networks. That's okay. why he asked you, and you know, oh. there's a lot of you know common interest.
very quickly. especially if you look at uh, have you thought of uh, applying it to optimization problems we uh, we have actually uh, in fact, uh, yes yes in fact one of the uh, initial impetus that we had to do this was to solve the timetabling problem mm. right so uh, we we failed miserably at solving the timetabling problem but i think we are getting better we are i i i sort of uh, have a hunch that we are reasonably close with some of the work that uh, uh, one of my students pratyush has been doing i think we are getting closer to solving the timetabling problem but in the process we learned a lot of other uh, things in trying to solve the timetabling problem but that is a similar constraint uh, uh problem and uh, I, i i think there are definitely a lot of uh, possibilities to look at optimization using using these networks yeah yeah it's a, it's a broad and yeah. very interesting yeah. area yeah. so thanks a lot uh, if there are no further questions i'd like to thank the speaker once more and thank you we'll we'll keep in touch thank thank you sri would love thank to you. hear from thanks you thanks a lot yeah. thanks a lot bye